Hello, I'm Dr. Neto and I'm here for more tips. Hi guys, this is um, an additional video about that topic that I mentioned before, class two amalgam versus composite. One information that I forgot to mention is like, okay, what about the width here of this occlusal box, right? So there is this instrument that is a good reference. This is it's called um, Oregon Plugger. I don't know if on the camera you can see the reference here, but I can put on the put um, a reference on the description of the video, right? Oregon Plugger. It has one tip that is very thin, like around 0.8 millimeter, and the other one is one millimeter. So this one millimeter end should go inside of your box and not be tight, okay? So all over need to be, but not kind of wobbly, not loose inside of your cavity, okay? So why you need to uh, to be freely going freely in on all parts? Again, because mechanically you need to condense the amalgam, right? This is a condenser. So if you don't, if you have an area of your preparation that is so narrow that your instrument cannot go completely inside and pack and condense that amalgam, that area of your amalgam is going to fail because it doesn't have the properties that it was supposed to reach at the end after the condensation, right? So it would be kind of fluffy, right? So this is important. So now regarding burrs, okay? So I would do, I would give you some hints about burrs regarding the prep. So remember when I mentioned that you should have a burr for the interproximal area that gives you a reference of depth. Normally we use on clinical life, this is the 245, which is a carbide cylindrical with a round tip, right? So that's a good burr for teeth. But um, let me tell you something, you could use the whole burr as reference to go inside of the interproximal area, right? So you know that your, the depth of your box is, is right. And for the occlusal preparation, you use half of the burr as reference because you know that your burr has three millimeter length. But there is a problem with plastic teeth, okay? Especially the ones of Acadento that it has carriers. The, those are special teeth and they are harder than those white regular teeth of Acadento. So what happened with those teeth that they are very, very smooth and brittle at the same time, right? So if you try to go with a burr, with a carbide like that, and you try to initiate your perforation to do your box here, that is going to be very slippery and then that's going to hurt some area that you don't want to, right? You don't want to touch. So my recommendation is try to get the burr that is spheric, uh, uh, diamond, cylindrical with a flat tip. So those two here that I have, this one is 835-010, which means that is one millimeter width. But I prefer to get even a smaller one that is the A35008, which is 0.8 of diameter, right? And it has the same three millimeter length, which means that you can use as reference, both for the interproximal area and for the occlusal preparation. Occlusal for amalgam, I can use half of the burr. For composite, I can use one third of the burr. And for interproximal, both amalgam and composite, I would use the whole length of the burr as reference from the depth, right? So now I'm gonna talk about one thing that is important is like when you do finishing of the cavity, right? In real life, what we use is a hatchet, right? It's like an, an instrument that is sharp and you use like a guillotine to, after you break the contact, you have here something that is called C shape or J shape, right here in this corner and right there in that corner. So you need to flatten that wall and remove that unsupported enamel with this instrument, right? So it has like a bevel. I don't know if you can see that. You see the bevel? 
So when you see the bevel, if you're working on the buckle wall in this case, the bevel should not touch the wall that you're working, but the opposite way. So the blade would cut and trim the wall and you have to really scratch it down, right? To make it flat and to remove roughness and unsupported enamel. Then you go to the gingival and you do the same and you really have to scratch until you feel it smooth. And then you change to the other side. Now the bevel again is pointing the opposite wall and then you work on lingo and you do the same thing. But guess what? For those new plastic teeth of Acadento for Adex, they are too brittle. If you try to smooth to do finishing with this with the hatchet they are going to break in a very collapsed way in an uncontrollable way and they are going to chip away like a big chunk of it and that's going to ruin your preparation so for real life i use this for finishing my cavity on patients right but not for typodonts okay okay so how i would get rid of that little C shape, J shape right here at that corner. Kind of tricky because there is a risk of touching the other tooth. So you would have to have a burr. Some people say like the needle burr. No, too big. This is a mosquito burr. I don't remember the name, the number right now. I can try to find out later. But this is very tiny and very thin. This guy's this this one is the yellow one, which is the not the coarse, not the fine, is the extra fine. Don't buy the white one because the white one doesn't cut anything, in my opinion. So you would go to that corner and carefully you would trim that corner to make it, especially for the amalgam, to make it that 90 degrees right here at this corner right and 90 degree right there because remember your amalgam need to be 90 degree right here okay so if you're dealing with patient in my case i would do first my interproximal box and then i start to do my occlusal box and then i do assessment of my cavity i would go with the spoon excavator to try to carve the cavity away, the decay away, right? And even for the plastic teeth. And you can use either or the spoon excavator or a round bird, low speed, but it has to be something bigger than two, okay? It should be four or six. If it fits six, you put six. If it doesn't, you go to four. Remember, don't use too much pressure because otherwise you're going to carve um, denting that is not infected but affected, right? So you just want to remove the infected denting and you remove the decay. I prefer in clinical life to go with this first, right? Carefully with this. And then I double check with the spoon excavator, right? To see if I still have soft tissue soft denting and then that's it right so that pretty much would help you with the preparation then you would be ready for restoration in case of adex exam you would need to uh, of course get the approval from the evaluator to go to the next step which is the restoration and again another thing disclaimer I'm showing you everything here freehand on just a segment of the typo though, and no uh, rubber dam, right? But even in real life and ADEX exam, how you would do this with the clamp here on number 31 going to number 20, 28, right? I would even do some ligature with floss here, here and there. Right, so you do the especially for ADEX, you do your preparation with rubber dam, and in case that you damage the rubber dam while you're doing your preparation, and now it's time to evaluate to see if you can go to the next step. What you have to do change your rubber dam, place a new new one. You're not you don't want to show the evaluator a completely tore um, rubber dam right place it again then 
you go to the evaluators to get the approval, then you can start the restoration, right? My next video is going to be some hints about the restoration. Okay, so and I have pretty much to say about that. Um, common mistakes and how to avoid them. So thanks for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel and see you on the next video. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. And if you're interested in one of our hands-on courses, please check the link to our website below on the description and see you on the next video.